Mexican government during the persecution, any religious act was condemned by the law. If they didn't fight in that time, we wouldn't have the, the churches open. We forget what our grandparents did for our faith. They were risking everything just to go to mass. They were risking their lives. They were normal people, and they were called to uh, participate in the defense of their faith, and they willingly said yes to that call. Part of the greater tragedy of the Cristero movement is that this period in Mexican history has been basically wiped away from the history books. One of the stimulating things in making the decision to do the film was that, first of all, I, didn't, I knew nothing about the, the Cristiada. You've got an incredible, captivating story with characters you care about. If you can put that in a background that's larger than life, that's epic, then you can transform the movie into something extraordinary. This is not only another Hollywood movie. It's a spiritual journey. Mexico in 1926 is reeling from more than a decade of war and violence. The Mexican Revolution of 1910 has failed to create lasting peace. President Plutarco Elias Calles seeks to centralize all power in the hands of the federal government. He views the Catholic Church as an obstacle to his plan. El Estado laico y empezaron a ver a la Iglesia los del gobierno no como una comunidad religiosa, sino como otro poder político. They are trying to eliminate every kind of competition. You have this authoritarian regime trying to control everything. Mexico's 1917 constitution imposes many restrictions on the Catholic Church. However, these controversial articles are not enforced until President Calles comes to power. Our nation is under siege. A plot to poison the minds and hearts of our people. This threat will not be tolerated. Y lo primero que hizo hacer una una ley que se llama Ley Calles para poner en acto la Constitución de 1917. Y fue cuando entonces el enfrentamiento fue fue terrible. Overnight, public worship is forbidden. The government seizes churches and monasteries and exiles foreign priests. Mexican clergy are banned from wearing clerical garb in public and threatened with jail if they criticize the Calle's government. Ante esta situación de, de persecución, los obispos de México resolvieron suspender el culto litúrgico, el culto de la iglesia, públicamente en los templos y ese cesar del culto se iniciaría el primero de agosto de 1926 y pues empezó la iglesia como en tiempo de, de las catacumbas a vivir en, en la clandestinidad. My father, he was all the time involved in the protecting and uh, helping uh, high priests and bishops during the persecution. And also my father used to disguise himself. In fact, my, my mother would have on her bed three different kinds of disguises. So once in a while, he would come rush in, change, and come out in the, with a different disguise. That was typical at that time.
the Mexican government was violently anti-clerical. Not just closing churches, but shooting, hanging, murdering uh, priests. They were losing their way of life, and at the end, they were forbidden to worship. So they came to a conclusion that they had to resist for dignity. People fought in self-defense, but it was the army against people with stones and uh, bricks and nothing. Many people in the clashes decided that there was no solution but the war. For the next three years, Mexican Catholics wage a guerrilla war against insurmountable odds. They become known as Cristeros, named after their battle cry, Viva Cristo Rey, or Long Live Christ the King. When the Cristero revolt begins, few take the rebellion seriously. Least of all, President Calles. He writes to the French ambassador saying that without mass and the sacraments, Mexican Catholics will soon forget their faith and the conflict would be over within a year. He really believed that. No more Catholic Church, no more fanaticism of the masses, of the Indian masses. And with his hostility, he, he couldn't understand the strong religious feeling of the Mexican people. El ser católico, el ser guadalupano, incluso ellos en los momentos de martirio lo expresaban con, esta, con este grito que venía del alma, que venía del corazón, que venía de su sangre y de, su, de lo más íntimo, de lo más grande y profundo que ellos tenían y la razón de vivir. Viva Cristo Rey, viva la Virgen de Guadalupe. Calles quería que nomás fue, fuera puro gobierno. Querían acabar con la religión católica. Y nosotros era lo que peleábamos, la religión católica. Era lo que peleábamos. Cuando agarraba uno el gobierno, ¿y ustedes por qué pelean? Por, por Cristo Rey. Viva Cristo Rey, Santa María de Guadalupe, era lo que le decíamos. But their heroic struggle for freedom becomes long forgotten under government repression and fear. That is, until the creators of For Greater Glory decided to bring their story to the big screen. I was searching for a group of people that really believed in what I was doing and could share that mission. This is not only another Hollywood movie, it's, it's, it's a movie of standing up for what you believe, it's a movie of that you have to have a spiritual journey. When I was exploring Mexico with Pablo, we got into the countryside and there'd be a little shrine for the priest that had stood up for his flock and had been killed for it. And it was really moving to see how important it was throughout the country and how lost it had been. I think this movie came to me more than I was looking for it because this is a period of history that nobody knows. So we got uh, a good scriptwriter from Hollywood to, to do a little bit of research on, on the period. We gave him the scripts and then he started getting fascinated about this. Michael Love, the writer, did an incredible job weaving all this together in something and that was very, very interesting and compelling. And what caught me were the lead characters and that they were these his heroic, inspirational people, people who cared about their homes, their communities, their faith, and they were willing to do what they had to to preserve that. What was great about the story and what Michael had done and Pablo had done in developing it was that they had pulled these specific, very interesting characters who had very different reactions on how to uh, achieve that goal. We must find another peaceful solution. Anacleto, the armed conflict has already begun. I say we support the rebellion. They'll need food, medicine. And ammunition. We can support them. 
with communication and plans. But we will not fight. Pablo Jose Barroso sent me the script and I said to him, uh, I want to be involved in this film. So I fell in love with Blesser Anacleto Gonzalez Flores. They call him the Gandhi of Mexico, peacemaker, a lawyer, a wonderful man, smart, lay Catholic. He was not afraid to die for his faith. The script attracted the attention of some of Hollywood's biggest names. My first intention was to try to get a great movie, not only an a great cast list, to go all, uh, around the world and to give the message. It was a very easy decision to make. I, I knew it would attract good actors. Essentially, for me, it's a story about absolute freedom and what are people prepared to do to protect those rights. In this case, the cause is their right to have religious freedom. And of course, the character of Gorostieta was such a, a dynamic character, and so it was such an honor to get a chance to play him. Andy, especially. For me, I think it's the performance of a career for him. Andy knew that this was a journey of faith for Grostieta. He, he couldn't find it. It was buried deep inside. And his reason for, for entering into the conflict and helping was to preserve the right for freedom. General Enrique Grostieta is a rising star in the Mexican military. But when the Federal Army disbands after the revolution, he is a general without an army. So that young man lost all hope, all possibility for a brilliant military career. He was working for cosmetics. And I, I found a letter of him who said, a general of the Mexican army making perfumes for the lady. What a shame, what a shame. Leaders of the National League for the Defense of Religious Freedom asked General Gorostieta to transform the disorganized Cristero fighters into a modern army. Okay, let's make an army. Let's make a uh, formidable army out of a group of ragtag peasants and huaraches, out of a few game ranchers, out of some tender-footed clergy who are trembling at the thought of holding a weapon for the first time. You want me to make a National Guard out of that? Look at me. Do you have proper weapons? No. Do you have an ammunition supply? No. Do you have a central command? No. How many is that? Three no's. All you have is belief. But belief will not save them in battle. Despite their limited means, the Cristeros rally around Gorostieta's leadership and grow in numbers and in strength. Their wives and daughters smuggle weapons and ammunition to the front lines. The only ammunition they got outside from the take in the battlefield, it was a work of woman. Without a woman, you don't understand the Christiana. Without a woman, you have no Christiana. The Cristeros' newfound success sends ripples of shock through the Federal Army. President Calles can no longer expect an easy victory. Me preguntaban que cuántos había matado, dije, no, yo no maté ni uno. Las balas, quién sabe, dije, yo no. The Cristiada, at, at its best moment, counted more than 40,000 rifles. 50,000 in small bands all over the country. And 25,000 in the center west of the country, 
under the supreme leadership of Gorostieta, the Cristero are climbing. Today we are going to send a message. We are going to send a message to Caius and to the rest of the world. That freedom is not just for writers and for politicians and, and for fancy documents. Freedom, freedom is our home, our wives, our children, our faith. Freedom is our lives. And we will defend it or die trying. It is not only our duty to defend it, but it is our right. You must remember that men will fire bullets, but God decides where they land. Que viva Cristo Rey! Que viva! Que viva Cristo Rey! Que viva! Que viva Cristo Rey! Que viva! They say that he was uh, there for the money or he was there for power because he wanted to become a president. When my grandmother died, she left uh, letters that my grandfather wrote to her. My mother showed them to me. In the letters, you can see that, that he really believed in, in, in freedom for, for the faith. He discovered the real Christianity in the face of the Mexican people and in the face of his soldiers. He might not be a religious person, but he, he believes in the right to be religious, you know, and, and the concept of absolute freedom. And, and in the process, he has a sort of a spiritual awakening because of the relationship he has with his young boy. There were two key roles we had to fill, Gorostiera and Jose. For Jose, we were getting a little worried because all the cast deals were coming together. We were getting closer and closer to our start date. We're on an incredible deadline. I have to make this decision very soon. We did three scenes. I had them memorized. We taped them. We watched them. It was Mauricio, Mauricio Curry. And we're like, he's perfect. I think for me, it was really important not only to have, you know, a real child, a real person about that same age that still had that incredible youthful exuberance and spirit. The character Jose is based on the real life story of Blessed Jose Sanchez del Rio, a 14 year old Mexican martyr whose courage and faith inspire his fellow Cristeros. His generosity. It's just overwhelming because you see a, a, a young kid saying that, Viva Cristo Rey, understanding how important it was for him to have faith. And he was able to transform that into the action of joining the Cristero army and then to the point of giving his life for the value of his conviction and his belief in God. Los mártires no fueron ni monseñores ni canónigos, ni, no. fueron eh, sacerdotes que estaban en el campo rurales. ¿verdad? Porque cuando apareció la revuelta cristera contra el gobierno, y muchos sacerdotes decidieron quedarse con su gente a atenderlos espiritualmente. Y esos son los mártires, los buenos pastores que no abandonaron su rebaño. Uh, Father Jose Maria Robles Hurtado was uh, from Jalisco. He was the example of a great parish priest. It is prohibited to say Mass, Father Robles. He was preparing for Mass uh, when, the, when the government actually uh, arrested him. He knew that he was going to die. He forgave his um, executors and, uh, and then um, they hanged him. I forgive you, my son. Father Robles is also well known as a proud member of the Knights of Columbus, an organization ruthlessly singled out for elimination. The Knights of Columbus began 
activities in Mexico in 1905. But by the 1920s, the Knights were very active throughout the country. And as the Callas government began to crack down on the Catholic Church, we were also victims and martyrs. Uh, many of our members lost their lives. Two-thirds of our councils were shut down by the government. Uh, six members who were priests have been canonized as martyrs. In the United States, the Knights of Columbus reacted to the situation, immediately passing a resolution at the Supreme Convention condemning what Callas is doing in Mexico. The Knights had also begun raising $1 million for the purposes of educating the American public about the situation with the persecution. The Knights of Columbus were, were tremendously influential. They created a, a positive public uh, opinion. Uh, they, they clearly mobilized American Catholics. But the Knights' efforts also raised the specter of anti-Catholicism in the United States. Supporters of President Calles include the powerful KKK. This caused a lot of criticism of the Knights. This is the 1920s. The 1920s is when the Ku Klux Klan was at its peak in America. I found in the archives of President Calles telegrams of the Klan, and they say to President Calles, the Knights of Columbus are raising a fund of $1 million for the Mexican Catholic Church. If you need it, we'll raise a fund of $10 million for helping you in your val valiant fight. The Knights create a public outcry that reaches all the way to the White House. Well, I warn you from experience that there's no negotiating with Caius. Thank you for your assessment and your advice, but I am the current ambassador to Mexico. The results of your tenure speak for themselves. Now, why am I getting all this pressure from the Knights of Columbus about this conflict between Caius and the church? Something that Americans hold very near and dear to their spirit is the freedom of religion. And so the, the fact that they were speaking to such clearly American values, uh, I think this is what gave them traction uh, in, in advocating for activism on the part of the United States uh, in terms of religious uh, persecution in Mexico. The Knights of Columbus met with President Coolidge and outlined the problems with what was happening in Mexico and basically asked for U.S. involvement, U.S. pressure on Calles and his regime to back off the persecution of the church. This pressure from both sides, from both ends, the government obviously from the United States was putting some pressure on the ambassador of the United States in Mexico. All this after three years helped to bring the government to settle things. So, so they agreed to sign what is known the Los Arreglos in 1929. The 1929 peace agreement opens the churches and restores religious freedom for Mexican Catholics. But the Constitution remains unchanged, allowing future governments to once again turn the law against the faith. For the Cristeros, the treaty was a death sentence. Fearful of a resurgence, 500 Cristero leaders are rounded up and executed. 5,000 others are purged in what becomes the Cristeros' final sacrifice for religious freedom. History has approached the Cristero Revolt with silence. Nobody was allowed to talk about that. It was, it's, it's a painful time. I think it's a vital question for the people of Mexico to know their real history. They're heroes. We have to recognize that they're heroes. It's time to set the record straight. This great new movie, For Greater Glory, uh, tells the record in a very historically accurate way. I want people, again, to connect with these individuals and see who they are, real people, flawed like you and me, who, when push came to shove, were put in a position and had to make a choice. And the choice was, do I run and hide? Do I abandon my faith, my beliefs, to save myself or my family? I think the example of the uh, men and women that participated in that uh, movement is a great example for us. Uh, it's a great lesson for us to learn uh, of uh, how important religious freedom is in our time. For me, it's more than only 
something that happened 80 years ago. I think this is something that really is the foundation, not only of, of Mexico, but I think also of, of the whole continent. I don't know what would have happened if these brave people wouldn't have stood up for their beliefs. Yeah.